Welcome to Idlewild Cottage, a quiet place where kindred spirits can linger together over a cup of tea, savoring all things lovely and cozy. My name is Juliana, and I'm delighted to have you. Each episode here at the cottage will center around a theme. That theme will be celebrated in a number of ways, through literature, art, nature, and even some favorite movie scenes, we'll cherish the sweet and simple things of life. So make yourself at home, and I'll put the kettle on. Happy Valentine's Day, kindred spirits! This month, we are celebrating loving relationships, both in literature and in our favorite movies. Well, because Idlewild Cottage is a community for kindred spirits, I thought it would be most fitting to step into the world of Anne Shirley for Valentine's Day. Anne is the most kindred of kindred spirits, and she takes her relationship seriously. We'll take a look at four significant female friendships throughout Anne's life and draw some connections from those to other favorite stories and movies. Before we get started, I just want to say a warm thank you for your continued encouragement and support of Idlewild Cottage, both here on the podcast and over in our Instagram community. Your likes, shares, and positive reviews are helping us reach kindred spirits around the world. As Anne herself would say, kindred spirits are not so scarce as I used to think. It's splendid to find out there are so many of them in the world. Let's start at the very beginning with Anne, before her Green Gables days. They are days of toil and hardship, certainly, yet in spite of this, we see Anne's strength of spirit and vivid imagination, especially as revealed in her very first kindred spirit, window friend Katie Maurice. Anne later describes Katie to Marilla. When I lived with Mrs. Thomas, she had a bookcase in her sitting room with glass doors. I used to pretend that my reflection in it was another little girl. I called her Katie Maurice, and we were very intimate. I used to talk to her by the hour and tell her everything. Katie was the comfort and consolation of my life. We used to pretend that the bookcase was enchanted, and that if I only knew the spell, I could open the door and step right into the room where Katie Maurice lived. And then Katie Maurice would have taken me by the hand and led me into a wonderful place, all flowers and sunshine and fairies, and we would have lived happily ever after. Anne's ability to find comfort in solitude brings to mind two cinematic heroines. We'll start with Fräulein Maria. The opening scene of The Sound of Music is iconic. Maria is twirling on a hilltop and singing with the birds, mountains, and trees, oblivious to her responsibilities back at the abbey. She later confesses, Oh, Reverend Mother, I'm so sorry. I couldn't help myself. The hills were beckoning, the sky was so blue today, and everything was so green and fragrant I just had to be a part of it. And the Untersberg kept leading me higher and higher as though it wanted me to go right through the clouds with it. The Reverend Mother asks, Suppose darkness had come and you were lost. Maria assures her, I could never be lost up there. That's my mountain. I was brought up on it. Maria is content in the beauty of her surroundings, finding a few of her favorite things, so to speak, wherever she looks. In Beauty and the Beast, we see that Belle has a similar outlook, though it is through literature that she feels her world expand. In an opening scene from the 2017 movie, we find Belle entering the church as the townspeople continue to sing of her peculiar ways. Father Robert says, Well, if it isn't the only bookworm in town. So, where did you run off to this week? Returning Romeo and Juliet back to Father Robert, she says, Two cities in northern Italy. I didn't want to come back. Have you got any new places to go? I'm afraid not. But you may reread any of the old ones that you like. Thank you. Your library almost makes our small corner of the world feel big. We'll head back to Avonlea now, where Anne's world is also expanding. Shortly after her arrival at Green Gables, Anne expresses her heart's desire to Marilla. 
Marilla, do you think that I shall ever have a bosom friend in Avonlea? Uh, a what kind of friend? A bosom friend. An intimate friend, you know. A really kindred spirit to whom I can confide my inmost soul. I've dreamed of meeting her all my life. As we know, Anne does find her first bosom friend in sweet Diana Barry. We see Anne's thirst for friendship and her flair for the dramatic in the solemn vow and promise which she proposes at their first meeting. Oh, Diana, said Anne at last, clasping her hands and speaking almost in a whisper. Do you think, oh, do you think you can like me a little, enough to be my bosom friend? Diana laughed. Diana always laughed before she spoke. Why, I guess so, she said frankly. I'm awfully glad you've come to live at Green Gables. It will be jolly to have someone to play with. There isn't any other girl who lives near enough to play with. Will you swear to be my friend forever and ever? demanded Anne eagerly. Once Diana recovers from the shock of Anne's intensity, they seal their friendship by joining hands and repeating the vow. I solemnly swear to be faithful to my bosom friend as long as the sun and moon shall endure. The friendship of Anne and Diana brings to mind two other favorite bosom friends, Betsy Ray and Tacey Kelly. Like Anne and Diana, Betsy and Tacey are first thrown together simply because they live near one another. Their friendship buds at the tender age of five in the opening pages of Maud Hart Lovelace's book, Betsy Tacey. Betsy has invited shy Tacey to her birthday party. The music started and Betsy chose Tacey for her partner. The girls took hold of hands and marched at the head of the line. They marched around and around the house and in and out of the parlor and the back parlor. Every once in a while, Tacey would look at Betsy sideways through her curls. Her bright eyes were dancing in her little freckled face as though to say, Isn't this fun? They marched and they marched and at last they were told to lead the way to the dining room. There the cake was shining with all its five candles. Betsy kept hold of Tacey's hand and they sat down side by side. From that time on, at almost every party, you found Betsy and Tacey side by side. Anne Shirley is quick to find kindred spirits in Avonlea and, in addition to her growing circle of school chums, wisely looks beyond her own age and situation to seek out others. As I shared in episode 14, Anne finds a dear friend in the older Miss Lavender. It is in chapter 21 of Anne of Avonlea that Anne and Diana take a wrong turn at a fork in the road and unexpectedly find themselves at Echo Lodge. There, Miss Lavender Lewis appears to be awaiting guests for afternoon tea. The girls plan to simply ask for directions and be on their way, but Miss Lavender has other hopes. Oh, won't you stay and have tea with me? Please do. We'd like to stay, said Anne promptly, if it won't inconvenience you. But you are expecting other guests, aren't you? Miss Lavender looked at her tea table and blushed. I know you'll think me dreadfully foolish, she said. I, I'm not expecting anybody. I, I was just pretending I was. You see, I was so lonely. I love company, but so few people ever come here because it is so far out of the way. So I just pretended I was going to have a tea party. I cooked for it and decorated the table for it and I dressed up for it. Diana secretly thought Miss Lavender quite as peculiar as report had pictured her. But Anne of the Shining Eyes exclaimed joyfully, Oh, do you imagine things too? That too revealed a kindred spirit to Miss Lavender. From Anne's friendship with Miss Lavender, we'll travel to the Great Smoky Mountains in the year 1912, where Miss Christy Huddleston is the 19-year-old schoolteacher for the children of Cutter Gap. Christy is a heartwarming 1967 novel written by Catherine Marshall. You might also recognize it as a television series from the mid-90s. Though divided by age, experience, and situation, like Anne with Miss Lavender, Christy discovers a kindred spirit in Fairlight Spencer. 
As David and I were leaving, Mrs. Spencer sought me out, timidly tugging at my sleeve. Miss Christie, could I speak with you? She pulled me away from the others to the far corner of the room. Look a here, you've never handled a school for. That's a heap of young'uns for one gal woman. Is there anything I can do to help? The words were spoken with a gentle dignity, as if a parting gift were being bestowed on me, as was indeed the case. Here was a mountain woman with a husband and five children to care for, living in poverty, yet thinking of me. Even as I started to answer, I realized something else. There was more to this gracious offer than met the eye. Fairlight Spencer was not just volunteering to do some washing and ironing for me. She was also holding out to me the gift of her friendship. Among the mountain people, this was the most cherished gift of all. Finally, I'd like to jump ahead in Anne's life to look at her friendship with Leslie Moore. Their relationship is developed in Anne's House of Dreams and reveals the unique tie between women who experience grief and allow it to draw them together. Leslie's story is woven throughout the pages of this book and it's as compelling as any of Lucy Maud Montgomery's gems. It takes time for Leslie to warm up to Anne, but when she does, the girls are as kindred as they come. Leslie finally bears her heart and confesses how she's harbored bitterness and envy when thinking of Anne's happiness in home and marriage. You know me now, Anne, the worst of me. The barriers are all down. And you still want to be my friend? Anne looked up through the birches at the white paper lantern of a half moon drifting downwards to the gulf of sunset. Her face was very sweet. I am your friend and you are mine for always, she said. Such a friend as I never had before. I have had many dear friends, but there is something in you, Leslie, that I never found in anyone else. You have more to offer me in that rich nature of yours, and I have more to give you than I had in my careless girlhood. We are both women and friends forever. The mature, selfless friendship that blossoms a little later in life brings us to our final movie, Miss Potter. This 2006 movie is based on the life of Beatrix Potter. Now, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to give too much away, so I'll just briefly highlight the friendship between Beatrix and Millie, beautifully portrayed by Renee Zellweger and Emily Watson. These women connect instantly and deeply, and when, later in the movie, they walk through a deep grief, Millie steps into the hard places, says what needs to be said, and draws Beatrix back into light and hope. It is the wise and gentle push Beatrix needs to make a fresh start and purchase Hilltop Farm. From the sweet friendships of childhood to the mature love that goes deep when things get tough, what a gift it is to both have and be a kindred spirit. How much greater even is the love God has for us. Psalm 139 sings of this. I'll close with a few excerpts from the Living Bible. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit or stand, you chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. You both proceed and follow me and place your hand of blessing on my head. How precious it is, Lord, to realize that you are thinking about me constantly. Thank you for joining me today, dear ones. Please come again soon to Idlewild Cottage. <laughs>